The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven you are my son the beloved with you i am well pleased the gospel of the lord good morning so nice to be with all of you i come to you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen So it's always funny to me when I hear people introduce me as having come from Texas because I don't think of myself as a Texan, even though I was there for three years. Um, I was at Virginia Theological Seminary to complete my training for the priesthood. So I did a one-year program because I did my MDiv a while ago. And uh, I was called to many places, but the one place that my bishop suggested was this place in Dallas. So I went to Dallas. For the first time in my life, I was in Texas when I moved to Texas during the pandemic, August of 2020. And so there's a part of me that feels like hopefully I get a little bit of extra credit um, for um, having been in ministry for three years during the pandemic as a person who had no friends or family there. So anyway, I always think it's funny um, when people introduce that because it's true, but it's funny. I I still sort of feel like I was a guest there for a period of time. So I say that. Uh, As a preface, thank you so much for your marvelous hospitality yesterday. So I was here yesterday for the ordinations, and it was so lovely to be able to be in this space, to be able to be present with your community and with the wider community across the diocese, and you really did offer such wonderful, wonderful hospitality in creating this space for people to gather, especially with the weather conditions. It was so nice to have a large parking area um, for people to be able to have a central place to come and for all of those ordinance to be able to be together here yesterday. And for me, it felt like a special bonus because when we visit parishes, we often don't get a chance to be in this space in advance. And I felt like it was a special gift to be able to be here and experience all of you, maybe a little bit, yesterday before coming here today. So thank you very, very much. Just know it was really appreciated across the diocese. So as you know, yesterday was also the Feast of the Epiphany. And today marks the first Sunday after the Epiphany that we celebrate as the Feast of the Baptism of our Lord. It's a day when we remember Jesus's revelation as the Son of God through his obedience in baptism. I did not grow up as an Episcopalian. I actually grew up as a Baptist. And so this whole idea of baptism, which I'll mention a little bit later, um, was such a significant conversation point in our lives. And so I was confused when I first became an Episcopalian or first started attending Episcopal churches that we go from Jesus' birth and the Magi appear, and then suddenly it's the Feast of the Baptism of our Lord, which is in Jesus's adulthood. Somehow I thought that we would trace 
aspects of his childhood or other um, scripture stories from earlier on, but we go directly from his birth to his adulthood. And so it's always been interesting. But at the same time, Epiphany is this time when we've got these new revelations. The scripture passages are all about the ways in which Jesus is revealed to us in new ways through scripture, through these episodes with the disciples. And so it makes sense that we would then begin with the baptism of Jesus. I say this because last year, I was serving at a parish in Austin, Texas, and I had the immense joy of baptizing several children from the family service that I led. Twelve children were baptized between Easter and Pentecost, and I was delighted to participate in this joyful ritual of welcoming these children into the household of God. Now, before I was ordained, I had worked as a hospice chaplain. I'd covered half of Massachusetts. I had also been the chaplain for a pediatric trauma center, and I'd covered an adult trauma center. So in my non-ordained life, my only real experience in ministry of baptizing others, because it's a sacrament and only priests do that, um, it was really emergency baptism, which is not often a joyful experience. So I had had this long experience of baptism under emergency, um, very, very sad circumstances, and suddenly I was able to have this amazing experience of baptizing children I knew, children who had helped in the service, children whose parents I knew, and to have this extremely, extremely happy moment with them and their families which I deeply appreciated. I remember one child who was a little bit nervous, and he was frightened. I wasn't really sure why, but when I think about it, you've got this very tall stand, and you've got water, and they're not sure what's about to happen, but they know that they're involved. And they've never, maybe they've never seen this happen before. Um, I think we need to do a better job of maybe demonstrating to them um, what this looks like in advance so that they're not wondering, oh no, is this the end of my life now with this bowl and this tall, um, this tall tower in front of me. I was surprised because he seemed like such an old soul inhabiting such a small body. And I was talking with his parents one Sunday before the baptism as I was carrying the gospel book to the sacristy, and this three-year-old's eyes brightened as he spied this shiny book. I held it toward him so that he could look at it more closely, and his mouth was agape, and his eyes grew wide like saucers. As I held it out to him, very solemnly and respectfully, he reached forth his tiny palm and touched the center of the gospel book. Then he looked up at me, and he nodded. I thought to myself, I wonder what he's thinking. What is he communicating to me? It was really a, a very insightful moment of interacting with a small child. This seemed to be a very holy encounter of the divine for him. And at his baptism, perhaps this holy awe consumed him as he stared at the water nervously until he pulled a racing green Jaguar matchbox car out of his pocket and slowly dipped the car into the water. Then he held it close to him as he nodded to me, <clears throat> and I whispered, are you ready? He nodded again, and we baptized him. Moments like this fill my heart with hope and joy when I think about children's faith formation through baptism as I remember my own baptism, or aspects of it. Believe it or not, I was baptized three times. Was that necessary? No, but people thought it was expedient. As a one-year-old in another country, my maternal grandfather baptized me in the Anglican Communion. At 11, members of my Baptist church debated my family's right to participate in church activities like youth group because my parents were not baptized by immersion. And so they required that my siblings and I be baptized by immersion, by proxy. Because of course, that was the only real form of baptism. And at 22, I was leading ministries at a local Baptist church plant and the pastor suggested that I be rebaptized because the first was invalid and the second was by obligation. The third would reflect my own obedience and personal choice. 
Through history, as you all know, I'm sure, baptism has been a divisive sacrament in the church. Who? What age? How much water? When? Why? Are the questions that circumscribe this sacrament? And yesterday, we observed seven people live into their call, into their baptismal covenant in a particular way, through their call to be ordained priests. In the baptismal covenant, you can take a look at this if you want to now, or you can look at it later. On page 308, when we welcome the newly baptized, this is what we say. We receive you into the household of God, confess the faith of Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, and share with us in his eternal priesthood. That last part, share with us in his eternal priesthood, is not a part that I had considered until I became a priest, because this call to share in Jesus' eternal priesthood is for all of us. It's not just for priests. And when we consider the gospel passage for today, we observe Jesus at the Jordan River. In an act of humility, he allows himself to be baptized by his cousin John, who also realizes that he himself is unworthy to baptize Jesus. So we have a little bit of a mutual admiration society in this episode. Humility and baptism leads to a public revelation of Jesus' identity as God's son, in whom God is well pleased. We read that the heavens break open. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove upon Jesus, and a voice declares, This is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus' ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing begins. We follow Jesus' baptism, his example in baptism, and this is part of our larger journey of discipleship. It is at the heart of what it means to be Jesus' disciple, to follow his example. Following Jesus' example in our lives is no ordinary call or task. And we are committing to pattern our lives after his own thought, word, and deed. This does not mean that we are perfect or that we strive for perfection. It means that we accept the cloak of grace, of God's grace, like the baptismal garment, in all areas of our lives. And like Jesus, we are the beloved of God. Sometimes it's hard to believe that, but we are. And depending upon what people's family of origin experience was of love, if it was given freely and unconditionally, or if maybe it was withheld, or if we felt that we had to earn our family's love or a parent's love, sometimes we displace that experience onto what we think that relationship with God is. For a long time, I unconsciously imagined the call to be Jesus' disciple as a joyless call to a sacrificial life that I would just choose to live in Christ. And noticing that Jesus is named as the beloved and that we, as theologian Henry Nowen describes, are called into God's belovedness, changes the tone and the tenor. Following Jesus comes from a call to be loved very, very deeply. Very deeply by God because of Jesus' sacrifice and not because of our own sacrifice. We are beckoned by love, and we are called into love, and we respond to Christ's love. It's a gift that is given to us freely. We don't need to earn it. There's nothing we can do for God to love us more or less than God loves us right now. And how do we enter into this love? How do we live into it? maybe recommend praying about who God might be leading into your life, who shows you more of God's unconditional love. Or maybe it's a small group of people. Maybe there are people here praying alongside, meeting with, and experiencing Christ's unconditional grace is how we learn to accept God's love. 
like wide-eyed children receiving the best Christmas gift ever? We, too, can share that same love with others. Immersing ourselves in scripture, prayer, Christ-centered community are some of the ways that we continue to align ourselves with the mind of Christ. Maybe some of you have found that participating here or in other places. And baptism initiates our life in Christ and our experience of God's love invites us into a deeper desire to be more like Christ every single day. The Holy Spirit enters in and empowers us to live a life in Christ that seems so impossible by our own merit. This season of Epiphany, I encourage you, and I encourage myself, to meditate deeply on Christ's love for you and the way that love draws you closer into an understanding of what it means to be God's own beloved, like Jesus. For us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and called through our own baptism to share that unconditional love that we receive freely with others around us, to share it with others in our family, with our neighbors, in this community, and in the wider world. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.